Hello everyone and welcome to Climate Australia. I'm your host Lee Constable and today we're talking about the parched earth and challenge, our challenges in understanding future droughts in a warmer world. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which I am broadcasting to you from. I'm on the land of the Gubby Gubby people, and so I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present, as well as acknowledge the ongoing relationship that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders in the over 250 nations that make up what we now call Australia have with land, sea, other waterways and the sky. Uh, so today's drought, uh, today's drought. Uh, today's episode, as I mentioned, is about drought. Uh, lucky we don't have a drought right now here in Australia, at least where I am, Touchwood. Uh, we've just come out of a drought. So a lot of people across Australia have experience with drought firsthand or because they are aware, perhaps in their metropolitan bubbles, that people are dealing with drought uh, in a more immediate way in the regions. Uh, I myself am someone with an intense interest in drought. In fact, uh, growing up in the millennium drought on our family's sheep farm in New South Wales, where my parents are still farming today, is what got me interested in climate change and the relationship with human between humans and the climate. Uh, and now has led me here. I'm still learning. I've still got lots to learn. And it turns out drought is a lot more uh, complex and challenging to understand than even I took uh, for granted uh, going into this. So I've got three of our excellent researchers from the ARC Centre of Excellence for Climate Extremes joining me, and I'll introduce them one by one now. So firstly, I'll introduce to you Professor Nerilee Abram, who is a CLEX Chief Investigator and Co-Lead of Drought. Uh, she is uh, an amazing person with a huge uh, bio of achievements, including being lead author of the IPCC special report on the ocean and cryosphere in a changing climate. She uses paleoclimate records to study how Earth's climate has behaved in the past and provide a long term perspective on recent climate change, especially how rainfall will change over Australia. The next guest that I will introduce to you is Associate Professor Andrea Tachetto, who is CLEC's Chief Investigator again in the drought program. Andrea's research looks at how ocean temperatures affect the global climate and impact rainfall over Australia. She's particularly interested in understanding the links between climate phenomena such as El Nino, Southern Oscillation and drought in Australia. And our final of three, last but certainly not least, we have Professor Jason Evans, who's, Cle who's CLEC's Chief Investigator and co-lead of the Drought Program. Professor Jason Evans' expertise is in the area of regional climate, land-atmosphere interactions, the water cycle and climate change. His focus is on regional climate change and its impacts, uh, but he also, and he also, I should say, has been an IPCC lead author, is an editor with the Journal of Climate and was a Green Globe Sustainability Champion finalist, uh, which sounds terribly exciting, Jason. <laughs> it's great to have you all here. Welcome and uh, thanks for telling us a bit about drought today. Um, Jason, what is, is a Green Globe Sustainability Champion, first of all? Uh, uh, this is a... Um... Uh, an award that's run by the New South Wales government. Um, and it really is just to recognize people who've been putting a lot of time and effort into um, sustainable solutions for some of our major environmental problems in Australia. Great. Well, um, congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I was I was bettered by some people who'd done a lot of great work as well in that. Ah, there's always people doing lots of great work out there, pipping you at the post, which is a good <laughs> problem to have. Uh, so I'll start uh, with you narrowly asking you some questions. Uh, let's start with the big one. It might seem basic, but the more you think about it, it's not so simple. What is drought? Uh, 
Yeah, that's a great question. And it's, it's a really tricky one to answer. There, there's no one definition as to what a drought is. Um, so we, we can talk about drought in terms of being um, a lack of rainfall. We can talk about drought uh, as uh, where the soil has dried out. Um, and we can talk about drought where um, that lack of rainfall and dry soil has then led to um, difficulty for, for plants to be growing. Um, and then all of those different aspects of drought have the, the social impact as well. Um, so, so drought is, um, it's a difficult, um, a, a difficult concept to just say, this is what a drought is. Right. Yeah. So defining what drought is, um, is obviously a challenge in itself at, and distinguishing between is this just a drier year than usual or a couple of years or how long does it need to be going on? So there are a lot of challenges in defining drought, but also measuring drought. Could you explain what some of those big challenges are? Yeah, so, so drought is quite different different to some of our other climate extremes. Um, so we have um, climate extremes that we regularly sort of talk about, like a, a heat wave that might last for sort of a few days um, or an intense period of rain, which might only be sort of a, a few hours. Um, but for, for drought, we're talking about um, a climate event that can be sustained across multiple years. And when we look back at Australia's um, observational climate record, we actually only have sort of a handful of past droughts to, to draw upon and to be trying to draw those sort of, look at those sort of conclusions as to, to okay, what causes droughts? What causes droughts to, to break? Um, are droughts getting worse? Um, that's really hard to do with the length of um, instrumental data that we have. And so one of the ways that we can tackle that um, is by using paleoclimate data to go a lot further back in the past. So we start to build up more of an idea of just what the natural range of droughts um, is and what's possible. Um, one of the things that we see when we look a long way back in the past is that um, it's possible in Australia to have droughts that are much, much worse than what we've experienced in the last 100 years. And that's even without um, any influence of sort of the ways that humans are changing the climate and causing droughts to become worse. Um, but just because of natural variability, um, there's a, uh, one of the, the droughts that we see for Australia, um, particularly from ice core records um, from Antarctica and using that to infer um, the lack of rainfall that parts of Australia we're receiving um, that there, there are um, there's evidence of droughts in the past lasting for 30 years. And so wow. the concept of what that would mean if we had one of those droughts today, if we have a drought for a few years today that really starts to put stre um, stress um, both on our agricultural industries, but also just on providing water resources to our cities and um, those types of things. But what would happen if we had a drought of that length today? Uh, so, so that's one of the ways that we try and um, overcome that problem of having a really short instrumental record to be trying to understand drought from. Yeah, and the idea of going through drought that's longer than my life is not a, one that I actually want to experience firsthand. <laughs> um, when we think about, you know, paleoclimate, we're thinking about, you know, what do we know from all of these records before human-made written records and measured observations um, could be referred to. Is Australia just dry or, you know, are we, are we necessarily, are we thinking of drought now the same way we did 10 or 20 years ago? What's changed there? <laughs> Yeah, over the, the past few years, there has been definitely a shift in the way that scientists are, are looking at, at drought and how we frame this problem. Uh, so particularly, uh, I think in the past, we've generally tried to think of drought, and I apologise for my noisy background here. <laughs> uh, everyone's in lockdown. <laughs> um, apologies for that. Uh, but we, we typically think of, um, have in the past thought of drought as being just a period of time where it didn't rain. Whereas actually part of this reframing is actually thinking of looking at Australia and saying, actually, we are naturally a dry country. The, the normal state is probably um, some sort of form of drought. And what's really important is when we have high rainfall events that break a drought. Um, and so what's going to happen um, in the future in terms of those drought breaking rain events? Will they happen more often or less often? And um, what does that tell us about our future risk? 
Yeah, and I suppose this is where, Andrea, you, it's your time to shine when it comes to talking about drought breaking. Um, people might be a bit confused when they first hear what that what you do. Um, and they might think, what does the ocean have to do with drought? Could you explain what this link is? Yeah, so the oceans play a really important role in modulating the um, rainfall in Australia. So the tropical Pacific and the tropical Indian Ocean are really important because they have those phenomena, as we call the modes of variability, the ones that we know um, more is the El Nino Southern Oscillation that has this relationship with Australian rainfall. And we, we've known that for decades by mm -hmm. looking at past uh, data and doing statistical analysis with these climate modes indices. And um, so when an El Nino uh, occurs in the tropical Pacific, generally the Eastern Pacific becomes warmer than normal. And that changes the atmospheric circulation in a way that affects Australia um, as well and the weather patterns for Australia. So um, in the case of an El Nino, it tends to be associated with dry weather in Australia. And the opposite phase, which is a La Nina, when um, the Eastern Pacific is cooler than usual, then it tends to be associated with uh, wet weather for Australia. So you can imagine that when El Nios and La Nias happen, then there is this associated association with um, having more or less rainfall and uh, in the past with um, related some of the droughts and floods with this natural phenomenon in the Pacific, the El Nino Southern Oscillation. So we can talk about, um, you know, drought, narrowly mentioned how drought has been um, a kind of natural part of the Australian continent's way of being, being dry, I should say, potentially not drought, whether or not we want to define it as that. And, and you're talking about other phenomena, um, related to that, that happened with the ocean that happened over years, not just within a year. Uh, so does this mean that uh, if we had a change in this ocean variability, we'd see a change in drought as well? Have you done any research to indicate that that might be the case? Yeah, that, that's very interesting. It's a fascinating topic, actually. So a few years ago, I decided to test that by simulating um, a hypothetical scenario where we basically exclude all the ocean variability. So you can imagine that it's a, a world that we don't have El Niños happening or Indian Ocean dipoles happening. So every year, the temperature in the ocean would be um, the same. Right. And uh, what we found out from this exercise, from this simulation, is that um, um, the ocean variability is extremely important for determining the intensity of drought in Australia and the duration as well. Uh, but more than that is when we exclude all these modes of variability, we still see drought in Australia. Mm -hmm. But the, those droughts are, are quite different than what we, we, we see in our world. They are less intense and they tend to last longer, which is quite surprising. Right. But this just shows how important are those modes of variability for uh, determining uh, the duration of drought or, or making this uh, breaking droughts, basically. Mm. Yeah, because I suppose when you think about a drought, you've got the thing that caused the onset of the dry period and the thing that the things that extend that over the course of years and then you also have the other element which is the end of the drought as you mentioned the breaking of the drought um, which obviously because of your research you can see has a has everything <laughs> has a lot to do with ocean uh, variability with Enzo and with the Indian Ocean Dipole as well um, I was wondering what we see as the impact of climate change on ENSO uh, potentially into the future? Yeah, we we had a like a, a recent um, review on ENSO in a warming climate, and um, what we see is that there is um, um, projection of ENSO that um, it's it's 
uh, will, will tend to be a little bit more intense in the future, the variability. But what we basically see that is related to, to drought is the change in the mean state in the Pacific rather than the change in Enzo variability. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard. We don't know exactly if the Enzo will, will in the future change, let's say, to be more of an Eastern Pacific warming or a Central Pacific warming. There are still uncertainties regarding that. But because of the, the tropical Pacific tends to be uh, warmer in the eastern side, it will change the way that those teleconnections will be for Australia. So um, we will we'll tend to see, yeah, it's, it's quite a hard a, a question because there is a lot of uncertainty associated to that. Yeah, and I mean, the reason there's uncertainty is also the reason you're all here, because if there weren't any questions at uncertainty, you wouldn't have a research program dedicated to answering these big questions. Um, so I, I might now go to Jason, your, your side of the story, because I think this links really nicely uh, to what you do when, when you're looking at land contributions. So we've talked about the contribution of the ocean, but how does land contribute to either the start or the end of the drought? Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, yeah, so the land obviously is a really important factor when we're thinking about drought. One, because that's where we see all the impacts, really. Um, but two, because it plays this role of um, intensifying the changes and adding to the persistence. So um, what happens is we might have a, a, a large scale climate teleconnection coming from ENSO, like Andrea was just talking about, which is, um, you know, El Nino providing a drying signal or drying um, uh, large scale effect to Australia. Once the land starts to dry out, that means um, it's able to produce, or it's only producing less evaporation. So there's less moisture in the air that's able to join, uh, to, to rise up into clouds and produce rain. So there's this feedback effect from the land, which increases the drying factor that's being brought to us from these large scale effects of the ocean systems around Australia. Now, on top of that, um, even once the um, climate mode like ENSO has then relaxed and gone back to a neutral state, because the land surface is already in this drying state, then its um, feedback is still there. So it still works to sort of keep the land in this dry state. And that adds to this persistence of the droughts um, that we see. Um, alternatively, it has a the sort of a similar effect once it's in a very wet state as well. So if we get um, the large scale systems changing to um, La Nina and bringing um, some drought breaking rain, once the land surface is really wet, um, it's then able to evaporate a whole lot more moisture, it puts more moisture in the clouds, which is increasing the rain that we see over the land. And so you get this same amplification effect happening at the wet end, as well as the dry end. So land really plays this role of amplifying the um, effects that are being brought from outside Australia, as well as adding to the persistence of these dry states once we're in them. Okay, like it's it's a lot to, to take on board when I just was thinking previously about drought as, you know, I was thinking about ENSO in terms of it's it's drier now and, and thinking about the lack of rain, but when you, then factor in the feedback loop of the drier it is, the drier it will stay. <laughs> and the more ground cover you have because of having more rain, the more we can hold on to that water and prevent drought and break and keep um, keep the rain that falls. So there's so many different factors. I can see why I narrowly pointed out at the beginning how, how complex drought is in terms of not just defining it, but measuring it. Uh, when it comes to land cover, um, we can't just obviously think of uh, forests, but we need to think about agriculture. What impact does agriculture, what impact does um, climate change have potentially on agriculture when it comes to drought? And vice versa, agriculture on, on drought, I suppose it's a feedback loop, like you said. Um, well, I guess there's a couple of things to think about here. 
um, in terms of land cover first, that different land covers have access to different amount uh, or depths of moisture in the soils. So there's some particularly sort of forested land covers that have very deep rooted and are able to access groundwater systems and stuff. And so ecosystems like that um, actually have a weaker feedback loop for the dry side. So they're able to keep accessing moisture through dry cycle for much, much longer. And that decreases this land feedback and decreases then the intensity or persistence of a related drought. Other land covers, which only access very shallow soil moisture. So this is our grasslands and most of our agriculture because they're um, all the annual crops. They only have root systems that grow for the growing season. So they're only accessing fairly shallow soil moisture. So those systems get this feedback loop happening much faster. As soon as you deplete the moisture from these surface layers of the soil, you start to introduce this feedback loop from the land. And that means that the droughts become intense, more intense more quickly. And they start to enter this stage where they, they're getting persistence of this dry state um, more quickly than deeper rooted land, land systems would, would have. So when we look at, oh, sorry, Jason, go on. Uh, so I was just gonna then sort of bring in the, the climate change angle for mm -hmm. that. So the other thing we need to think about in terms of climate change, besides the rain side of it, which we've been mostly talking about so far, is of course, how we lose moisture from the land surface, which is evaporation and transpiration from our plants. Um, now, in this is um, related to our temperatures, our atmospheric temperatures, because the warmer the atmosphere is, the more moisture it can hold. Okay, so you can think of increasing the temperature of the air as increasing the evaporative demand of the atmosphere. And that essentially allows the land to evaporate more or evaporate more quickly, or the plants to transpire more or more quickly. And um, we've done studies looking at what's happened over the last few decades globally in terms of evaporation. And for the vast majority of the globe, we do see robust increasing trends over the last several decades. So as we've been warming, we've been observing these increases in evaporation. So that means, so for drought, that means that obviously we're, we're increasing the rate at which we can dry out our soils because we're mm -hmm. removing this moisture faster. And so we're sort of increasing the rate at which we go into a drought state. And that means we increase the, the rate at which we get the land into a state where it starts this feedback loop, increasing that drying again and keeping us in this sort of more persistent dry states. So we've already observed that the climate change that's happened has already been putting us into a position where we dry out faster and can be um, entering these drought light states more quickly. When we think about going further into the future, it would seem certainly from the evaporation side of things that that, that trend is likely to continue mm -hmm. along with as warming continues. And so that sort of cycle of more rapid evaporation more rapid drying of the land surface and the feedbacks from the land surface to the atmosphere giving us these persistence in dry states is likely to be more common um, more commonly seen as we increase our evaporation from the surface yeah so so a lot of different um factors feed into drought uh beginning the drought the drought's duration breaking the drought and every single one of those factors is impacted and exacerbated by climate change yeah Pro probably <laughs> some, some are some are impacted in a fairly um uniform way everywhere mm -hmm. in the globe so the the evaporation factors i was just talking about with the increasing atmospheric demand because of increasing temperatures that's that's pretty universal and we see that everywhere the changes in the rainfall and and, and drought breaking rains um have a fairly strong dependency on changes in large-scale circulation and as Andrea was was mentioning, that's a bit less certain, and it's very location dependent. Yeah. Um, on how those changes will play out. So, so there's some parts of this problem that we understand quite well and can predict fairly well, and there's other parts that even though our, um, that we don't understand as well, and certainly our predictions uh, have much lower confidence. 
Yeah, and I should point out, you know, if you're watching and listening to this um, from outside Australia, as happens on the World Wide Web, uh, then we are talking about drought uh, in the context of Australia particularly, but of course there will be areas of the world where drought was more common and it becomes less common and areas where we're more worried about heavy precipitation and more storms as opposed to less correct like monsoon regions for instance uh that's true that's true um the changes with climate change though they don't separate so easily into those two categories mm -hmm. um there's actually many places where the projections suggest that while in the mean these places will see less rainfall yep. so will be drier on average when they do get the rainfall the rain that comes will fall at higher intensity. So you'll have bigger storms. So you have longer dry periods in between storms and then bigger storms when they happen. So mm -hmm. there's this um, result that you see in a lot of locations where you can see increases in both droughts and floods, even though at first it would seem that those two things wouldn't go together. Um, this is a not uncommon projection when we're talking about what's going to happen because of climate change. Yeah. For, for a place I, like Australia, we already have a lot of droughts and a lot of floods. Yeah. Um, having more of both is probably not ideal. No. And I'm just thinking about those feedbacks uh, when it comes to land cover, that the, the more drought there is, the less potential land cover, especially across um, farmland. And then the heavier the rains that come, the more, you know, topsoil washing away, the the harder the wind blows, the more it blows away, the erosion issues, uh, it all stacks up. <laughs> so yeah. We are um, coming to the end of our, our uh, half hour, but um, I might ask you all after we roll some credits to do a little bit of Q&A um, after the fact, uh, just for, for a few minutes, if you've got the time. But um, before we, we wrap this interview, I just wanted to give each of you the opportunity to, to just give us a little takeaway. What, if people are watching or listening this to this and um, thinking about drought and what that means for them and their region, what's one thing that you'd like them to take away, either you know a concept you wish more people understood or, or something they can do to find out more? I'll start with you, Narely. Yeah, thanks, Lee. Um, so for me, I think one of the big takeaways um, that I think is really important that we get this message across is that the our historical experience of drought doesn't cover the range of actually what's possible. And so when we're planning for the future and particularly the potential of um, human-caused climate change um, increasing our drought risk, we also need to, to take that um, into that planning and, and be thinking about how would we cope with droughts that are even longer um, or more intense than what we've already experienced. Yeah, and Andrea? So uh, for me, I just want to um, tell that the ocean variability is really important for the modulating rainfall variability in Australia and determining this duration and intensity of uh, multi-year drought in Australia. It's obviously not the only thing, but it's one of the factors that we, we, we do consider um, for drought. Absolutely important to just to consider that. Thank you. And Jason? Uh, I'd say we should be aware that as we continue to change the climate, this will change um, the kind of droughts that we experience. Um, for Southern Australia in particular, it looks like that means more droughts, probably longer droughts, more intense droughts. Um, how we manage the land um, is important and will really decide the way we um, handle these droughts and these changes in droughts. So we need to think a lot about how we deal with uh, managing the land. Absolutely. Well, thank you all so much for uh, joining me and helping break down everything from what is drought, what does it look like in the past in Australia, what does the ocean have to do with drought, what does the land have to do with drought, everything, everything has 
<laughs> has a lot to do with drought. Uh, I hope that uh, if you're listening or watching this back, I, you'll check out more information about this. Of course, uh, we're sharing the CLEX website. And if you've got questions, you're not the only one. That's why there's these researchers and research programs looking into uh, becoming more, getting more certainty around certain aspects of what this could mean. So appreciate your work. We're going to uh, head to into the end of our episode and show some credits, but we'll be back shortly uh, for a little q and I've got a few questions I can see in the chat for you all to answer. So thanks very much. Thanks, Lee. Thank you, Lee.